You wrote a piece this week that I want to talk about because it sort of talks to about a broader question. It also, there were two other pieces that sort of caught my attention this week. Um, uh, one was by Jonathan Chait, and the other one was by um, uh, um, Lefitz, Eric, Eric uh, Lefitz, Lefitz yeah. uh, and both at the, the New Yorker. And they, they're, they're, all three are related in some way. New York Mag. Yeah, New York Mag. But all three are sort of related in one way. I mean, it's, it is um, either a bad idea on how to uh, fight Trump <laughs> or just sort of like bad execution. Mm. So let's start with yours about Chuck Schumer, because this... Um, just walk us through the piece, and then let's talk about it uh, um, um, in a more in a in a broader sense. Yeah, sure. So Chuck Schumer, um, uh, the Senate Minority Leader um, uh, in Senate in the Senate from the great state of New York since the 1998 or 99, uh, and uh, so you know with like what we were just saying with all of the news that uh, the the all of the bad news going on in the world, um, there's any number of ways the, the Democrats could. Uh, sort of try to get headlines for themselves and their efforts to fight against Trump. And Schumer last week, um, after first uh, with Nancy Pelosi putting out a, pr a good idea in a, in a newspaper op-ed for a program to raise, a federal program to raise teacher pay and school resources, he just did that in an op-ed, no, like no press conference. The next day, he calls the cameras for a press conference at a gas station in Washington to stand outside the gas station blaming Trump for high gas prices. Um, and Classic politics. <laughs> yes, no, exactly. On Chuck e. Schumer. Yeah. And yeah. Here is a, here's a photo uh, here's a, yeah. that you put at the top of your post. Yeah. Um, it is Chuck Schumer standing there with uh, Dick Durbin. And mm -hmm. uh, who is that also? Uh, 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 is that Barbara from Maluski? Or no, 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 excuse uh, me, the woman from Michigan. Michigan. What's no, Stabenow? Is that Stabenow? No, 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 no. Stabenow, This right. is from, she was from, uh, from Delaware or No, Maryland? she's from Michigan. Debbie Stabenow's from Michigan. That's not Debbie Stabenow, I don't think. Uh, well, the point is, the reason why it's difficult, uh, yeah, tell us why it's difficult to place it. <laughs> because that photo at the, at the top of my story is from 2006, um, <laughs> when uh, Chuck Schumer, in advance of the 2006 midterms, held a press conference outside a gas station in Washington to complain that George W. Bush was responsible for high gas prices. Um, so here, it'll work then, it'll work now. <laughs> here's a photo from last week. Um, I didn't have the rights to use this photo, and I couldn't find a wire photo that I could use because no one cared. Um, like there, like there were a couple photos out there, but like none of them that we had that we, but hardly any. He got no coverage for this. Like I, a lot of people didn't know Chuck Schumer did this last week, which is a, maybe a sign that your political stunt failed. Um, the only mention it got in the New York Times, his hometown paper, was in the middle of a story about how uh, gas uh, oil prices were falling. Like immediately after this press conference, oil prices started dropping. Um, so it was effective. Yeah, it was. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. he got results. It, All right. To be fair to him, don't you think after coming out on an edu on education spending and he said something about decriminalizing marijuana a couple weeks ago that it's like relaxing to get back to the <laughs> gas pump? Well, but no, here's totally, the. Yeah. I mean, the okay. But putting aside the problems that this is bad policy. Sure. All right, because it's bad policy. We should have. We should be raising the gas tax. The gas tax is uh, hasn't been raised in something like thirty years. Yeah, and so it's it's lower than all of the Western European countries. It's yeah, it's like and there's nothing more than we need is to raise the gas tax yeah. for a nu for numerous reasons. Yeah. So it's bad policy, but it's also it was also impacted in California. I mean, talk yeah. about how just sort of how. Um, uh, how much of the tin ear this is in terms of not just, I mean, you've talked about it, 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 the implications, it's, it's a tin ear on a national level, yeah. but even on a more macro, a micro level, right. like in California. Yeah, the politics of this, so in, in California, which the entire government is run by the Democrats, um, and the Democrats just raised the California gas tax in order to pay for much needed infrastructure repairs and in order to... Uh, uh, build more mass transit. Like, this is good policy. This is what Democrats should be doing when they win power in states. Um, and of course, because California has ballot initiatives, Republicans, bankrolled by rich people, have put a ballot initiative or are trying to get the signatures to put a ballot initiative on to uh, repeal this gas tax increase. And they're hoping that getting this ballot initiative on will 
boost Republicans' chances in the midterm elections. So to have the leader of the, one of the leaders of the National Democrats out there complaining about the high price of gas um, is not like it's it's also actively harmful to Democrats trying to hold a majority and actually govern. Right. So not only is it not effective, it is a net negative yes. in a myriad of ways. Not even on a policy. We're just talking like even if you're talking about pure politics, yeah. right? Um, so these are just really bad politics. Let's go through a little bit of what Chuck Schumer has also done on top of this, because it, it seems to me it starts, I mean, early, early on when Chuck was like, I'll go and meet with uh, Donald yeah. Trump. And, uh, you know, if there's an infrastructure bill I like and this and that. A month later, it looked like, OK, that was the smart thing to do. Yeah. It made it seem like he was going to be reasonable. And then uh, Trump wasn't. But I actually think he was foiled yeah. as opposed to. I think you're right. Yeah, that he planned something. I think he because come December of 2017, do you remember yeah. this? Uh, 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 remind people because he completely lets the Republicans off the hook. You mean with the shutdown and yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yes, yeah. And so I, I think you're I think you're right, which is that like the cynical way of doing it would have been like, well, we tried to work with Trump, but we couldn't do it. But like make a show of working with him. I think Chuck is like, I'm a New York guy. He's a New York guy. Like and also he thought he could outsmart him. He thought he could he thought he could roll him. But like what he didn't you know, this is the the thing that people have learned over and over again is that Trump and the White House, quote unquote, are not the same thing. So if Chuck Schumer goes in to Trump and says, Let's make a deal on on uh, on Dreamers. Let's make a deal, and and Trump is like, all right, sure, you got a deal. Like he he, he leaves the room, and Stephen Miller walks in the room right. and says, well, no, we are not making a deal, and that's it. That that kills it. And so Schumer, I think, was like, I can work with this guy personally, and didn't understand the politics of it. Didn't understand just sort of the the structural barrier to like actually getting a deal done with this White House. But so, but yeah, I, I think that's like. But but I just want to put a, a fine point on this. In if you go back and look at the coverage in November of 2017, every like the amount of stories, I think people could just Google like a uh, legislative apocalypse in mm. November of 2017, because the Republicans were looking at like five different things. They were like the debt ceiling, yep. the um, uh, they they couldn't pass a budget because it was in the wake of, I think, some other um, I can't remember which hurricanes it was or which massive storms, and they couldn't get the funding for that with the budget, mm -hmm. and, and they, uh, they, they wanted to split it off, but they couldn't do that. Um, and there was, uh, there was two or three other deadlines that were coming up. I can't yeah. remember if it was S-chip or something. And, yeah, it was S-chip. And the Republicans, and, and, and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer walked over to the White House and basically said, we're going to take... 25 to 40 percent of what you got or even 50 maybe it was 60 percent in terms of like difficulty off the table yeah. we're gonna th we're gonna clear that up for you and that's why they ended up getting the tax cuts in my estimation mm. because they weren't in total disarray uh going forward they, i think they were worried about the um uh the resolutions expiring and they totally messed it up yeah they totally messed it up and since then he's done a ton of things like this it seems to me yeah what can i do to help <laughs> no i mean i they because uh, you know republicans especially when it comes to things like continuing resolutions and budgets they can't govern without democratic help because their own freedom caucus members blow everything up so like that's the uh, built-in leverage the democrats should have um, Pelosi's usually been a little better about navigating this, but like Schumer, I, I think you're right. Like they went in and said, all right, we'll help you out. We'll do this. Um, because their instinct, Democrats instinct is always like, well, let's at least make sure government's running properly, which great. <laughs> um, but then, you know, it allows for Republicans to actually implement their agenda. But so Schumer, um, since then, uh, you know, in the interest of helping Trump govern, he's, you know, allowed, uh, Trump to have his CIA uh, chief approved and he he's allowed Trump to have his secretary of state approved and like all these other things that are like you he could have held up and gummed up the works if he had wanted to. There, there was multiple ways where they could have done it. They could have done it where he could have tried to whip votes against them. Yep. Um, I mean, if Chuck Schumer can't get Mark Warner yeah. to vote against uh, certain things, then there's a real problem, it yes. seems to me. Yeah. Um, because Mark Warner is not like, you know, this is not Joe Lieberman, supposedly. Yeah. I mean, no, he's... Yeah. He, um, and I, 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 let me ask you this. As you, rep as you go and report, what do you hear in terms of other senators... Um, and cause I've heard, uh, that, um, 
certainly former senators are um, think that Schumer's really screwing up. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I think if you, you don't have to look that far to see hints that um, some former Harry Reid people are not thrilled with how he's doing. Um, and Reid, and I think a lot of people on the left sort of never liked Reid that much, but he knew how to play the game. Like, he absolutely did in a way that Schumer is not showing that he does. Um, and, like, there's a, in, an interesting alternate history is, like, how would Reid have navigated this first Trump term? Because I think it would look totally different on the Senate side. I think it would look totally different. And I think I think we may not even have those tax cuts, to be honest yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah, we might not. Like, it might have been a complete legislative failure, but... Um, it's a real problem. Is Who? that Schumer knowing less than Reed? Uh, or I is, think it, is it his actual sort of politics or instincts are different? I think that he... Um, well, I don't know. I think it's a couple of things. Because I, I don't know. Because I don't, I don't have any sense. Reed is almost a McConnell-like figure in that I don't have any real sense of what his personal politics are. Um, but he seemed to um, just want political success. And, and hates but, Republicans and supposedly doesn't like to cut Medicare or Social Security. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. But Schumer, I mean, first of all, Schumer seems much more concerned with his own personal image yes. and his own personal yes. brand than Reid yes. ever was. Yeah. Um, and uh, and as, uh, maybe just much more limited in his thinking. Like that's what like something like the, the gas prices thing just to me just just smacks of someone who has an incredibly narrow vision of politics. Just very, very narrow and provincial idea of politics. Well, he literally says he has a made-up family that lives in Massapequa that he yes. runs policy <laughs> by. That uh, says yeah. a lot. Yeah. That says, that's his favorite. He his literally one of his says that. That's not in And any I way. would bet that's probably like the area where he pulls the worst. And so <laughs> yeah. he decides that's where my family, yeah, like, ah, my made-up family is going to be. Schumer. This is exactly, <laughs> this is exactly the problem with his politics is that yeah, he has a made-up family from Massapequa. He calls them the Baileys. They're a, you know, a boomer couple. They used to be called the O'Reillys, but then when he was writing a book, he de-Irished them to make them more national. I'm sorry, the Baileys? Yeah. I mean, Baileys is pretty Irish, That's too. That's still pretty. It could be yeah. English, though, right? I don't... You know, New York has changed where Jews are not, <laughs> not as much of a problem on, yeah. uh, on Long Island. But yeah, so, so they, yeah, they, live, they live in Massapequa. It's a new city. It's a new state. But in his, in his imagination, he runs all of his idea. He runs all of his political calculations through this well-off homeowning couple in a nearly all-white Long Island town. And he's like, what would they think of what I'm about to do? MS-13 <laughs> is terrible, but get in front of the gas pump, Chuck. Yes, no, exactly. Immediately. Yeah. We're, 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 we're driving out to Montauk this weekend, and right. we want, yeah, yeah. we like... <laughs> I mean, part of the problem could be is that the Baileys, uh, neither Mr. or Mrs. Bailey, has ever uh, spent any time in the Senate. And so their ability yes. <laughs> to be the Senate leader yeah. is probably uh, minimal. Yeah, right. Like right. He probably goes like, how should I get my caucus to do this? And they go, what do you mean caucus? Yeah, they, like, the mean? Baileys don't know how to whip votes. <laughs> like, I like, asked them how to kill the Haspel nomination. They had no ideas. <laughs> right. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> Chuck, we keep telling you, we don't understand Senate rules. Yeah. They're so Byzantine that so so is anybody like actively are you hearing anybody actively talk about about any type of challenge to his leadership? I, I not really. And I think that um I mean I you know, I, I haven't heard anything there. Some people are dissatisfied. I, I feel like the Senate, that's much rarer in the Senate than it is in the House. In the House, there's challenges to leadership pretty regularly. Not not terribly effective. Not terribly effective, but at least people talk about it pretty right. openly uh, on, on Democrats and Republican side. In the Senate, it really, it just seems like um, because of the norms of that body, people do not openly be like, we got to we gotta replace this leader. Like, I, you know, even Mitch McConnell, who's pretty widely hated by the right for crazy reasons, does not have a lot of threats but he he i mean he's insulated because i think everybody in the senate i think like anybody who has any type of savvy or or, or, or like you know is hues to the you know the the sort of the classic republican agenda right where the money is yeah. he's got to be very happy with oh Mitch of McConnell, course yeah, yeah right i mean yeah. he got the tax cuts he's doing um he's getting every uh you know the the judiciary yeah. is done i think cory robin had a comment the other day about how uh this republican party is actually the least populist it's ever been yeah. uh, you know uh trump may be po uh, a populist 
You know, that's where the votes may be coming. But in terms of what they're doing, it's all based upon, you know, the judiciary and uh, sort of yeah, Senate no, it's, machinations. It's, it's, built, it's based on building in uh, a, a, an undemocratic uh, infrastructure to, to, like, keep their agenda in place. Like exactly. Oligarchy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And um, I, well, let me ask you this. Uh, what is your sense if... If there was to be someone in the Senate now who would be a better leader, is there one? That's a great question, and I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I know there are senators I like more. I don't know if they are cut out for leadership. Um, you know, it might be. I mean, you know, again, with the problem we run into with congressional Democrats is they've done such a poor job of, I guess, grooming younger generations of leadership. Right. You know, so it's like you have these people basically 70 years old who've been there a long time and then a lot of people in the middle who have not really made much of a name for themselves so um i, don't, I mean it's it is, it's an interesting question to, to ask like who would be who would be a better minority leader and you know i don't i don't actually know that is a uh, like i think a society-wide problem that the boomers uh their shadow cast yeah. over basically uh my generation yeah um because there was no room for it had to squeeze in like there was a slight moment of, yeah. of like cultural and I think I think that's a a, a widespread problem. Do yeah, you have frankly. any ideas in mind? Uh, the only person I have ever heard people talk about, and I, look, I have no idea what the skill set is that you would need to to do this, the but I've heard people uh, talk about Jeff Merkley, who uh, you would you would assume is is too um, to the left, yeah, right, but. Um, Another guy, fairly soft-spoken. You know, that was the thing about Harry Harry Reid is yeah. that, you know, people would look at him and they would talk about, you know, I think Limbaugh used to call him Dirty Harry. And then you would see, like, and, which conjures up an image of Clint Eastwood yeah. with, a, with a gun. And, and then Harry Reid would sit there and he looks like, you know, he, he looks like... Uh, I asked somebody once who didn't know who Harry Reid was. I was like, what do you think this guy does? And they go, I don't know, pediatrician? Yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> yeah, literally. And he yeah. would just sit there and just look meekly and... You knew that he had like a like a sixteen inch blade right. underneath the table. Exactly. And he was, uh, Merkley has that sort of quality too. I yeah, think on some yeah, level. Yeah. But here's the thing: wh why I think I, I heard uh, someone suggest this: uh, he was the only senator to endorse Bernie Sanders. Uh. Yet, yet he did not alienate anyone else in the Senate because of it. Yeah, Respected and he managed to sort of like walk that line. Yeah, which was, uh, which suggests that the guy has the ability to both sort of like maintain relationships yeah. and to you know still present some type of of perspective. Well, that's I, one of the things about the culture of the Senate, and I think it's one of the things that sort of destructive about it as an institution is that absolutely those um, personal relationships matter more than ideology. And I think like you look at the hatred in the Senate for someone like Ted Cruz and it's not ideological. They just don't like him. Right. And like, fair enough. And comedy, comedy with a T um, beats everything else. And so you could, you could definitely have a fairly, I think left wing uh, democratic leader as long as they respected those personal relationships, I think. Yeah, and I think that's a big part of it. I mean, maybe that's why, you know, it, I don't know whether or not he has the mind that yeah. one needs to sort of, you know, play this chess game out. But um, this sort of dovetails a little bit with, with that, that Chait uh, yeah. Leffitt's, I don't want to call it a debate, but it's, it's out there where Jonathan Chait had written a piece um, basically saying that the left was problematic, that that is not a new theme of his. Um, probably one that he's been writing about, I don't know when the first time I ever interviewed you, but it, it was probably a decade, at least a decade yes, ago, yeah. and it was, uh, Chait was w well into that theme yes. for, for many years. Um, but the twist is, is that he was promoting the democracy movement, which right. is the first time I've ever heard of that movement, <laughs> right? Uh, which it's is, and there's a new organization I think that started uh, where Bill Crystal is signed on and Benjamin Wittes and yeah, like, and they're like the Pritzkers are behind. Yes, it. yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. and huge uh, Democratic money, ostensibly to save our democracy right. from from Donald Trump. The, yeah. and that the idea is we uh, 
we got to be nonpartisan yeah. and just focus on saving our democracy. Put our agendas aside mm. and focus on this, uh, uh, um, on, on this democracy movement. And uh, Eric Leffitz um, wrote, well, you know, the real danger to our democracy is uh, all of the, uh, the, the way American capitalism, I think he puts it. Yes. Um, and which I think he would also define as, at this point, highly monopolistic, completely, um, uh, you know, uh, there's a disequilibrium. Mm. Um, uh, labor has no power. Um, I think you could also say, you know, capital has far too much power. Mm. Um, Two-tier justice system. Yes. Because of it. I mean, all the problems that we see with, with American capitalism today. Uh, he says that's a, a bigger threat to democracy. And the real problem with these norms movement mm. is that you got to vote for Chuck Schumer and Democrats to take over the Senate yes. and then say, send us your nominees, um, you know, President Trump. We're not going to filibuster them. We're not. We're <laughs> going to give them hearings like you've got to do all the things that I think a lot of Democrats, even Democrats, mm. you know, if you go to your average Democrat and say, hey. Do you hope that if the Democrats take over the Senate, that they're they going, restore norms? They like, re <laughs> they, but even like restore norms, they're going to be like, well, yeah, uh, maybe. Sure, yeah. but, but if you say like they're going to seat that first justice that comes through, <laughs> they're not going to they're not going to uh, do any payback for this stuff. I think I think yeah. now the Democrats would say that's insane. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's one of the one of the things about, I guess, asymmetrical partisan warfare um, is that, um, you know, I can easily foresee if the Democrats retake the Senate, them bringing back the the, the blue chip, uh, the blue, blue slip, blue slip. I mean, the blue slip uh, thing, which is where if a, if you if a home state uh, senator of either party objects to a judicial nominee, they get to put a hold on it, um, which is a you know long-standing tradition. Ron Johnson did it for one guy who just got seated for seven, eight years or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, and Republicans have just finally, after threatening to for a long time, finally gotten rid of it. Yep. And they did that because, you know, they actually know what's at stake and they want to fill the judici judiciary. And so when Senate Democrats retake power, like, are they going to bring that back? Like, if there's a Democratic president, will they be respecting that? Will they be respecting that norm again? Because if so, this is, I think, what Chait, what Chait always tries to posit the left as being anti-democratic. Um, but in this instance... Um, the norm would be upholding an anti-democratic principle, which would be installing a judiciary that doesn't reflect the will of the people. Right. That uh, a sort of neo lochner judiciary consensus that would like hold back what the what people collectively want ha to happen. Right. The result would be anti-democratic. Yes. A. Yeah. B. Also, I got to say, blue slips. That's not, not exactly democratic. a democratic no. institution, no. <laughs> right? The idea yeah. of letting one uh, one senator from any state any, yeah. to, to uh, inhibit the uh, federal judiciary, I don't really see the democratic aspects of that no, at exactly. all. Yeah.